Are victims of domestic abuse or narcissistic abuse doormats? Should we hold them responsible for being in an abusive relationship? And why aren't they holding boundaries better? In fact, what does it actually mean to hold a boundary? These are the types of questions we're going to take in this episode of Breaking Free from Narcissistic Abuse. I'm your host, Dr. Carrie McAvoy, and thank you so much for joining me. Be sure to subscribe, leave a review. We are listener supported, so thank you for your contribution. So let's listen in to this replay of a TikTok Live on Breaking Free from Narcissistic Abuse. Victims experience a lot of criticism for being narcissistically abused. I've been giving this some thought, but this reviewer was very left a very provocative, a very thought-provoking comment on my book, Love You More, The Harrowing Tales of Lies, Sex Addiction, and Double Cross. She referred to me as a doormat and then ended the review hoping that I had become stronger, that I had learned my lesson and uh, was no longer so, so easily manipulatable. This is not the first time I've heard this comment. I'm sure any of you who've been trapped by a narcissistically abusive relationship has heard similar things said about you as well. I'm sure many of you have had people struggle to understand why you stayed so long, why you put up with so much, why you didn't leave at the first hint of problems, why you, uh, maybe they even think that you you missed the red flags, that there was something wrong with you for not getting out faster. So I got to thinking about this, you know, why, why, was I a doormat? And how do we know when someone's being abusive or not? Because here's the critical piece that most people don't understand about narcissistic abuse. We're in a relationship with someone who has created a deception. Everything that we're experiencing is not actually authentically true. We're being purposefully deceived. So how do you know when something's, dis- when something's not true when the goal of it is to keep you in the dark so that you don't know that it's not true? I got to thinking about my first marriage to my late husband when he was dying of cancer. He wasn't easy. You know, one of the things that happened, he had a very rare form of cancer. It was small intestinal cancer. It invaded his nervous system and gave him early onset dementia as he was succumbing to the illness. And one of the symptoms that happened was he actually had psychotic symptoms. So he believed delusional things and he would accuse me of stuff that was really horrific. And this is, we'd been together 30 plus years and, you know, this wasn't him. This wasn't the normal way that he would be if he had been healthy. The question I have is, was it abusive? Absolutely. The things that he said to me and, and things that he accused me of was absolutely abusive. But I knew that it was related to the illness, that it was due to the cancer. And I knew that he couldn't help it and that the supportive thing for me was to, to overlook it, to keep getting, helping him get treatment as he succumbed and then to be just, you know, to sort of be long suffering about this. Because what does it say about someone when you walk out on someone who's dying because it's too inconvenient for you, because it's a little too hard for you? We don't think highly of people who do that, right? So put this juxtaposition against those of us who've been in a narcissistically abusive relationship, especially with someone who has said that they have a problem that they're trying to work on, and they maybe even do things that look like they're working on it, like go to therapy with you, maybe go to couples therapy with you. And yet they, you don't really know that they're continuing to do the things that they shouldn't be doing because they're hiding it from you. But yeah, you see abusiveness. They're not always nice. They still lose their cool. But you think that you're working on something and you think that they have a problem that they're taking seriously. Are you a good person Does, if you walk out? What is different between my late husband dying of cancer, who's abusive because he's sick, versus a mentally ill person or handicapped person who's sick, who says they're working on it. Do you walk out on them as well? That's what people, that's what, that's what the audience around us, our community around us doesn't understand. That these issues are way fuzzier. They're not so clear. And when you're in these situations, it's very hard to know what is actually real and true. And we want to be a good person. We want to be someone who's loyal and sticks things out. Someone who's, you know, understanding and and patient and shows kindness. 
And isn't it interesting, though, that we're somehow to say, oh, it's abuse. That's not good. You're a doormat. You should stop. You need to get out. And, and if you don't, then you have a problem. There's something wrong with you. And yet there are a lot of situations in which we put up with things that are challenging because there's, there's mitigating ex- circumstances and we understand those things. I would love to hear more about how it's been for you, what has been your experience, and how do you deal with it when you get this kind of criticism in your world? How are you dealing with the fact that those around you maybe invalidate you, minimize you, maybe even call you a doormat and think that you're, you're foolish? When you know that it wasn't that simple and that there is a whole host of reasons why it was very difficult to leave, very difficult to leave. Thank you so much for joining me today on this live. I'm very excited to spend this this time with you. I'm Dr. Carrie Kerr McAvoy. I'm a clinical psychologist. I have over 20 years of counseling experience. These days I don't counsel or coach, but I primarily create content and educational material. And I'm also working on a course for cognitive dissonance around things related to narcissistic abuse. I also wrote a book called Love You More. It's an autobiographical uh, look at what happened to me as a psychologist who got into a narcissistic abuse, abusive relationship called Love You More. So today I would love to hang out with you. If you want to ask me questions about this it's obviously this is not to substitute in lieu of counseling but I'd, I'd love to talk about these topics with you or anything related to mental health issues I see there's lots of comments already coming in so let's hop in and see what you guys are thinking about today and thank you so much for following me what's the difference between partner and parent that is a great question and it's different in a few ways but in many ways it's very similar it's similar in the sense of you're experiencing deception, you're being used as an object, you're actually not really valued and seen as a person, your emotions, your emotional life is being cut off and uh, very limited, you're not really able to show up. You're doing a lot of management around the relationship in order to keep the other person happy or at least not upset. So those things are the same. What's different is that as an adult, your sense of self is more formed. You've had a chance to have life experiences and you know a little bit more about yourself. Whereas a child, you're actually born into this dynamic and you've never known anything different. So the problem with that is that you then learn right from the get-go that it is your job to take care of other people, that it's very hard to show up and that trusting people is difficult. So it's more likely to have a lasting, more uh, profound effect on the way that you attach to other people. Very similar, but yet different because of your ego strength, your maturation will make it different. So, um, but both both are highly toxic and have destructive ramifications, extremely re- destructive rela- ramifications. But fascinating question. I have never been asked that before. I really love, that's great. How do I relearn boundaries? Yeah, that's a, that's a very, important question because one of the things that happens irregardless if you come from a toxic home or you've been in a toxic relationships then the the thing that you have been encouraged is not to have good boundaries you in fact you probably have been even attacked for maintaining boundaries it's very hard then for you to realize that it's okay for you to have boundaries but let me let's even define what boundaries are because we're making assumptions that we all know what we're talking about Boundaries actually is just a fancy way of saying where you begin and someone else ends. An obvious boundary is your body. When someone touches your body, they've invaded your space. That's a boundary breach. Unless you've given permission, they shouldn't be doing that. But emotional boundaries are things like uh, criticizing your feelings or, or dismissing what you prefer or forgetting things that are important to you. Those, those things are like also boundary breaches. There are ways of saying that you don't exist and that you don't matter. And isn't it sad that some of us have learned in order to maintain a relationship that we shouldn't have boundaries, that we that those are seen as conflictual to have a boundary. So the best way to relearn them is I would recommend that you identify what makes you uncomfortable, where people are like, do you have a hard time saying no? Are you afraid you're going to disappear or disappoint people when you set a limit? Like when you say, hey, I can't I can't go out tonight or um, I really need this today. Are you finding that that's really hard? I would recommend that you kind of identify where your weak spots are and then identify who's the hardest to do this with 
and who's the easiest. So for example, you may find it really easy to set a boundary with a cashier, but you may find it really hard to do it with your partner or maybe with a parent. What I would do is practice with an easy person and then as you get to find it getting easier, then begin to take on the harder people until you get better and better. But here's the other trick to getting better at relearning your boundaries. Learn what it feels like when a boundary's been breached. I usually feel like I'm trapped, like I've been compromised. I feel upset, uptight. So I've learned to feel that in my body. And then when I feel it, I know, oh, I've let someone cross the boundary. Then that helps me to move back and say, okay, what boundary just got crossed that I'm now uncomfortable? Did I, did I agree to something that I really shouldn't have? Did I, did I, did I tell them that they shouldn't have done something and when they did it? I mean, what, what have I done that has caused this uncomfortable feeling? And that then helps you identify where your boundaries are being crossed because you're reacting. When someone crosses a boundary, it affects you. You feel, you feel affected. I don't want to, you know, the strong word is violated. You know, when it's really a major via, a boundary breach, it'll be a violation. But a lot of boundary breaches are small. They're, in, they're more irritations or create, you feel ir, frustrated or irritated. So notice what it feels like in your body and then use that as a guideline to know when it's happening and know what boundaries that you should be getting better at protecting. Back to the question on parents versus partner, I'll tell you, people who grow up in dysfunctional homes with, with toxic parents aren't allowed boundaries. Boundaries are seen as a fence. It's a, it's a, it's, here's an example from my family. My two-year-old, uh, my oldest was a handful. He was so busy. Oh my goodness. Literally, I, I, I would have needed to keep him on a, I one time took him into a, I think it was like a bedding store. Next thing I know, the kid was jumping on the beds in the store. I'm not kidding you. This is what my two-year-old was like. It was disastrous. When I had the second child, when he was three, I couldn't go anywhere with them because he was he was running around everywhere. So we went on a family vacation. And one of the things our family loves to do on the way home is stop at this tourist souvenir shop that had expensive gifts like soapstone, little miniature uh, carvings sitting out on low countertops. It would have been like a nightmare to take this kid into this store. He would have been touching, knocking, running around. So I said to my father, hey, next year when we go, we're not going to stop at the souvenir shop. We'll just stop and say goodbye to everybody and then we'll head on home. This is what my father said, because remember, boundaries weren't okay. He said, well, then next year it's just better that you don't go. So that's what happens in toxic families is that they, they actually will they will attack you for having a boundary. Boundaries aren't allowed. Be, be warned that the more toxic people in your world are not going to respond well when you set a boundary. You may get a lot of pushback from them because they see it. And interestingly enough, they protect their boundaries really well. They don't let you cross any of them, you know. So, um, but, be, but be warned that this is going to be viewed as a threatening situation. So you want to kind of be prepared for that. Be really prepared for that. And yes, I agree, Minna. It's really important. This is what I heard from Lindsay Gibson on a continuing ed seminar that I've almost finished. It's been wonderful listening to Lindsay Gibson. So she wrote the book, uh, Adult Children of Immature Parents, Emotionally Immature Parents. Awesome book. Love it. One of the things she said in this seminar, it's never killed us to have someone mad at us. Yeah, we may lose the relationship, but we're not going to die. So I, I, uh, I agree. It's, we need to learn to survive people being unhappy. And here's the other thing about boundaries. When someone runs over your boundaries, they're essentially saying that you don't matter, that your needs, your likes, your desires, your dreams, your hopes, even your body, it doesn't really matter. What matters is their feelings, their needs, their hopes, their dreams. There's no reciprocity. It's all them and not you. If you lose the relationship, are you out a whole lot? Probably not. Probably a lot of pain, actually. Thank you for that very vulnerable question. That's a great question. So what is psych psychothymia? Psychothymia is a low-grade depression. There's, uh, I'm sorry, it's a low-grade bipolar disorder. And dysthymia, this is why I mixed it up, dysthymia is a low-grade depression. Both mood disorders, depression, major depression and bipolar disorder, which are both mood disorders in the DSM-5, have another version that is a low-grade version of them. In other words, it's like 
you're sick with a cold, but it's not the flu. You know, it's the, sort of the milder version of it. But what's problem with it is it's very long lasting. So cyclothymia is not uncommon for you to be struggling with this for more than two years plus. So mild swings of depression and mania, instead of the major swings that you tend to see, it's a it's a more of a milder swing that you're seeing. And there's also, like I said, the companion diagnosis called dysthymia, which is a mild form of depression. So both of those are mental disorders. And primarily, I would really encourage you, if you're struggling with that, to see a psychiatrist and, and be able to talk about medication because medication is a very, very important part of treatment for both bipolar disorder as well as depression. I, yeah, I know most people have never heard that term. It is, a, it is an unusual term. It's not something you see much spoken about. So yes, it's a kind of an odd term, but that's what it means. Uh, some, the, someone's asking about I've, I've, how your family's been nip, manipulated and now you feel obligated. I, I don't know the whole situation, so I'm kind of trying to sort of infer from this qua- comment what, what you're speaking about. But it's, one of the things that happens with boundaries is that often people triangulate. Have you heard of the word triangulation? That is whenever we pull in a third person in order to use for power. So think of kids, for example. Kids triangulate all the time. You and your brother or you and your sister get into a fight. And then next thing you know, someone says, mom or dad. That moment, that's triangulation. They're calling in a parent in order to gain more power in order to win their side. That's what's happening. They're hoping to get you in trouble. It's trying to, so triangulation is always a way to manage power. It's when they think they don't have enough, so they're boosting their position with you. Chances are that is what's happening with your family, is that your family's being pulled in to obligate you. You're being tr- they're triangulated into the problem, is my guess. Which, the best way to close a triangle in order to stop it, because we're adults, we're not kids. This wouldn't work if you're a kid, but it would work as an adult for you to say, listen, I don't appreciate you involving the family. This is between you and me. To me, that's a violation. You've betrayed me. It hurts my feelings. Maybe you don't want to use violation and betrayal. They're too strong. But if you're that angry, maybe it fits. So you might say, in the future, you need to deal with me. I'm not dealing. If this happens again, whatever it is, I'm out. I'm not doing it. You do this again, I'm not doing whatever it is that you're trying to manipulate me on. Now, don't say a limit. This is back to boundaries, guys. Never threaten a limit that you can't carry out. If that's not possible, if you're going to if you emotionally are not ready to do that, you can't not not go, then don't say that, but say whatever you can handle. One of the things that happened to me and I think it happens a lot to a lot of us, you will get people try to push you to set limits you're not ready to set. I know that there are people who saw my marriage to this second person who is a narcissistic sociopath and said I needed to leave and that I was allowing him to disrespect me by staying. But here's the thing. I didn't have an exit plan. I seriously didn't have any exit plan. I had nowhere to go, no home to go to. I was out of the country, guys. I didn't have anything back in the United States. Where, what was I going to do? It was easy for them to say that, but they didn't know that for me, there was a whole lot of steps that had to be happen in order for me to be able to leave. I'm saying that to say, I knew I couldn't say that. I knew I couldn't set a limit and say, I'm walking out because walk out to where? Make sure that whatever you do, that in order, when you set a limit, that you can do. So it would be more fair for me to say, you know, next time you do this, I'm going to do whatever, you know, whatever it is that works for you that feels like a consequence. I'm going to exit the bedroom for the next month. I'm going to, I don't know, whatever it is, it kind of fits the fits, you know, whatever consequence fix the violation. Make sure that you're ready to hold the boundary with your family and with your partner when they obligate you like this. So someone's been talking about therapy. There's some therapy questions come in. Yes, I know that it's hard to find good clinicians who are experts in narcissistic abuse. I also know that a lot of therapists who have an expertise do have a waiting list. That's really unfortunate. One of the things that you can, that when I, I used to have a waiting list as well, that was common for me. One of the things that you can do that might help is to tell the person when you call in that you'll take even, if there's a cancellation, that you'll take it. 
let them know that you're open to can- accepting last minute can- cancellation. Because by the way, that happens. You know, when you get into the suddenly get into the day and you find you got a several couple open hours because someone got sick or whatever. If you knew you could call someone in a last minute and get them to fit in, it's always very beneficial. So that's one way to get around it. But it is just, unfortunately, the hard part of finding treatment these days of really good people. I, this isn't really a question. This is just really a comment. But I just want to acknowledge that, yeah, being bipolar, which means, and then you're in a relationship with a narcissist, oh my goodness, that means you're under tremendous stress. And stress for a, anybody with a bipolar disorder is not good. It tends to make the, the disorder worse and resistant to treatment unfortunately. So one of the first advices that we give to patients who are just diagnosed with a bipolar disorder is to reduce stress. You know, make sure you're eating well, that you're getting your sleep, that you are not being overly taxed in order to kind of keep your body regulated because you don't want it in a constant state of fight or flight. And the problem is with narcissistic abusive relationships is that they throw us in a chronic state of this. In fact, They've been finding out that creates brain changes in us when we are in these states for long periods of time. Your hippocampus, which is controls memory and emotion, starts to shrink. That's why, and also there's like decreased functioning in your prefrontal cortex, which is why you fight, forget things. You're feeling confused. You're struggling with keeping on top of life and feeling organized. And then they find that your amygdala, which is your fight or flight station, it's the it's the part of you that keeps you safe. It's the part that watches out for you swells. It gets bigger. Is that surprising? Of course not. It's wor- working overtime trying to keep you feeling not so scared or uh, alert for the possible next threat. So yes, it has very serious ramifications for us for being in these abusive relationships. I hope you get have a good treatment program, that you have a lot of good support and that you are getting help with being able to set limits around the narcissist so that you can stay healthy. So I'm really sorry to hear that. That's a very tough situation. It's tough for all of us, but it's even made tougher when we have, and it's true for any type of disorder, like even inflammatory diseases. Um, How many of us have some kind of like arthritis or um, maybe we're struggling with some kind of pain or we're having all sorts of these kind of body struggles and we end up, um, and then we're in these situations, and then they go into, you know, this hyper inflammatory state of stress that causes more problems with their their health conditions. A lot of you are commenting on my hair, so why don't I address that? And then, as you know, one of the rules of the room is we don't talk about my parents, but because you guys are really... (laughs) Okay, if you read my book, Love You More, The Herring Tales of Lies, Sex Addiction, and Double Cross, you know I suffer from severe alopecia. I have a severe hair loss that I suffered after my third child. I was super sick with my pregnancies. My last pregnancy, my heart rate, resting heart rate at night was 120. 120 at night sleeping. I was. They said that I was actually in a form of congestive heart failure. So when I gave birth and had the child and I lost most of my hair actually. And here I am 34 and I'm Oh, it was, I'll tell you, it was a very dark night of the soul for me. This is not uncommon, though. I've known at least several other women who've experienced the same thing. I hear that it's common. It's not uncommon for childbirth or pregnancy to do this to some women, cause massive hair loss. So I wear a wig. This is, if you were curious, I use Shirley's Wig Shop. It's actually, shockingly, not expensive. Um, and it's synthetic. It's not real hair. And I, this is the wrong color. I ordered a different color, I thought, and they sent me this color and I realized I said the wrong name, but it's a happy accident. That's how I could, that's how I view it. It's a happy accident. By the way, wig wearing has been incredibly freeing and it's cheap. It's less expensive than you guys are doing to keep your hair color up and all your hair styling that you have to do every month. I'll tell you, it saves me time. I just throw my hair on. It always has the same style. I never like, it doesn't need any styling. I'm telling you the truth. It's, it's, it's been such a relief to do this. And so that's, that's what, but, so this is a happy accident. This is kind of called, I think it's called marbled brown. And it's kind of a honey, gold, honey, a honey brown. So thank you. But now I'm going to move on. But yeah, it's, hair loss is actually affects I think upwards to 40% of women is affects hair loss. We just don't talk about it. It's kind of a hidden epidemic that 
a lot of us are suffering with, and then we get feel so much shame, you know, on, around it. I did. I felt a lot of shame. And then this narcissistic abusive partner, whoa, it became an issue. He started using it as a way to have power over me, to hurt me. I So one of the ways I've taken my power back is by sharing it in the book and sharing it with you because I, you know, why should I, why am I letting something like this define me, really? Especially when someone who's ill is using it against me. See, that's one of the things that's kind of tr the tricky kind of a way in which you can sort of leverage, take leverage back. What is the narcissistic person in your life using to hurt you? How, what are they threatening you with? For, uh, for me, being bald was a big thing. He was really using this against me. So how can I take it back? Roll into it. Roll into it. Don't, the best way to get it to make it not powerful is to take it off the table. Now, how many times do we watch a show that, uh, that where someone's being threatened of, they're going to tell on somebody else? Go and tell. Take it off the table. Then, then, you, then, then they have no power. You've taken the power back. So for me, for me to tell the whole world, hey guys, I wear a wig. I had a hair loss. No big deal. Doesn't change my value as a person, at least not me, to me anyway. It takes it off the table and he, his power is gone. Thank you for being interested in my book and my story. Thank you for following my content, all of that. I super appreciate it. Bye-bye.